There's been a lot of discussion of the cancellation of the Constellation program to go back to the moon. I never thought much of it. It was a silly idea to try to retrace the steps of our ancestors, going to a place where they went better than we would. Uh, where's the glory in that? Going to a sterile rock. There's only one place on the moon that's worth going to, and that's down at the southern poles. I worked for the fellow who first suggested there might be ice there. And that might be of some value, but we're not ready for that. Um, so the Constellation program just did not impress me. Well, what was the basic concept? Make a somewhat rehashed Apollo capsule and perch it on top of an expanded space shuttle solid rocket booster? The thing that killed the Columbia astronauts? No, the Challenger. This was just a very silly idea. Uh, no, we, we, we need to move ahead. We need to think more boldly. And the first step is to do what the right wing and the libertarians have been asking for for 40 years. And that's to open up, launch to low Earth orbit, to commercial competition. I don't know why they aren't singing Obama's hosannas right now for doing this, at last. But now uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX and uh, various other endeavors by Jeff Bezos and others will compete with Boeing. Uh, and, and, and presumably at this point we're going to start seeing the price of a, of a kilogram to orbit start to go down. And that's key. But what do we do beyond that? We should have a goal in sight. And I don't think Mars by itself is a great goal, but many of the technologies that are involved in getting to Mars would also get us to the asteroids. One near-Earth crossing asteroid, a kilometer across, would contain the entire world's iron and steel production for a year, all of its gold and silver production for 10 years, all of its platinum group elements production. Well, uh, John Lewis of the University of Arizona has estimated that as much as a thousand years worth. There's a lot of wealth to be had out there. And it's one reason why the Russians are sending their grunt mission to Phobos. We've never visited Phobos, the larger moon of Mars, and it may be the most valuable real estate in the solar system, and they're planning on planting an, uh, a probe there soon. If it turned out that Phobos contained carbonaceous materials with volatiles like water, then an in-situ uh, propellant production plant on Phobos could create in advance all the water and all the return fuels needed for an expedition. Then if uh, Zubrin's notions of in situ propellant production on Mars were set in place, a robot on the surface collecting from local materials the fuel needed for an ascent stage, then we could send our eventual expedition and it would find the return fuels needed already in place. One of the biggest failure modes erased. But I want to talk about that issue of supplies. So far in space, we've been sprinting. What do I mean by that? Um, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, even this, even this uh, space station of ours, all within quick reach. We, we fret supplies on the space station only, so, only because they're there for so long, and we always assume we can send up a capsule. The, the Apollo missions were very similar to Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic. The main thing they cared about with supplies is how to carry as little as possible. When we go to Mars, when we go to the asteroids, we're going to have to rediscover the obsession of Amundsen and Shackleton and Magellan, and the other great explorers in our ancestry, who cared about supplies, supplies, supplies. They fretted supplies more than anything else. Even when you're blitzing to the top of Everest, half of the time you get there is multiple trips up to base camp to set up the supplies that you, a smaller group needs to do multiple trips up to the assault camp, and so on, and so on. This is what Amundsen did and what Scott didn't do very well. We need to know 
that when we go to Mars, all the supplies are already there. And most of the supplies that we need will be water, wrenches, TV dinners, things that are not specific to the design of the mission. In other words, these are things we should be sending now. Especially if it's possible to trade time for efficiency. There are some possible ways that using ion drive freighters, possibly even huge solar sails. The experiments on solar sails, by the way, have been delayed 50 years. Ask yourself why. With giant solar sail freighters or ion drive, we could send water, wrenches, and TV dinners this decade while we're still arguing over what the Mars expedition would be like. How to land? How many people? It doesn't matter. If we were to develop those freighters, we could send the water, the wrenches, the TV dinners, the non-mission specific grunt supplies on a lowest bidder basis to orbit or land on Phobos and be there when two decades from now we finally send the crewed expedition. Crewed as in C-R-E-W-E-D, not crewed. Though that's always a possibility. The point is that by eliminating the carrying of these supplies from the main expedition, it can be done cheaper, faster, with more attention to this one mission, and that's to get the people there safely, as quickly as possible, as little radiation damage. There are so many possible advantages to this. Caching of the non-mission specific supplies in advance. For one thing, once you've done it, it's an incentive to go. Call it cancellation insurance. People are less likely to cancel a mission if all the supplies are already there. But again, this reduces it to the lowest bidder because we don't have to compulsively check safety in a cargo of Gatorade. There are so many reasons to do this, and I've discussed it in an article online, but it's just one of many possible quirks that could change our whole approach to how we're going to take our next step in space.